Dan Gordon will unleash the superhero in you. In each episode, Dan will challenge and inspire you to be the greatest version of yourself. Dan takes you into the minds of the world's most innovative thinkers, unlocking their secrets for living fearlessly and achieving massive personal success. So get ready for Shock to the System. Please welcome your host, the coach's coach, Dan Gordon. Right now, in this moment, you have the power to live your life unlimited. Shock to the System is about pulling back the curtain on your world and discovering what you're truly capable of achieving. In the next hour, I promise to take your mind on the most compelling journey through this experience we call life. I promise to share ideas and concepts to set your thinking on fire. And I promise to show you a new reality where success is nothing but a mindset. If you're ready for an adventure of a lifetime, strap in. It's time to put a shock to your system. Let's go. Today, we're going to be talking with a very, very successful person. Now, what image just popped into your head when I said that? A very, very successful person. Do you see a a giant mansion, a yacht, a helicopter, maybe a big office building with someone's name across the top? Well, my guest has all those things. A mansion, a yacht, a helicopter, a big office building with his name on the top of it. And I wanted to talk to him for two reasons. One, I want to know what it feels like to have all that stuff, right? But two, and more importantly, I want to know how he did it. Because clearly this guy is thinking thoughts and doing things that most of us aren't thinking and doing. What is it? We're going to find out. I I talk a lot about success on this show. And the problem is most people confuse success with money. It's not the same thing, not by a long shot. But don't get me wrong, money's great. It tells you that you're doing something that a lot of people find valuable. But for some people, success is about being happier, more satisfied, having more free time, more love, getting what they truly want out of life. Success is whatever you define it as. But getting there, that's a different story. I want you to imagine that you're standing on the edge of a cliff, On the other side, across a thousand foot drop, is another cliff. That cliff is where success lives. Now, spanning this gap between you and success is a dangerous rope bridge. Cross that bridge, you get everything you want. But the problem is that bridge is straight up horrifying. Crossing it, you think, might kill you. So what do you do? Well, we don't like to admit when we're afraid of something, do we? So instead of facing our fears, we create these little stories to justify not taking action. These stories all tend to start the same way. Something like this. I'm not ready yet. I can't afford that. I'm too busy right now. Yeah, I'll get to it. I'm just being lazy. The funny thing is, when you tell these stories, they don't sound like stories at all. They make perfect sense. Let's say crossing that rope bridge is going to cost you $10,000. If you don't have the money, you can't afford it. If it takes a week to get across it, you don't have the time. Or maybe you want to do it, but you're just being lazy. Are these stories? Or are they just the truth? Every great person who ever lived, from Dr. King to Steve Jobs to Mother Teresa to Elon Musk and on and on and on, all had the same doubts and fears that you do. They all had a choice to live in their story about why they can't or to feel the fear and do it anyway. So do you. But the real problem is, with every challenge you avoid... The stories you create become more and more believable until your life becomes just a a bunch of stories. You sit around telling yourself and telling other people why you can't have the success that you want. So what do you do? Are you screwed? Not by a long shot. All you need is a little support. Someone by your side who has already crossed that bridge and who can navigate you every step of the way. That's what I do every day, all day, for my clients. 
They have a coach. Me. That's why they succeed. I've been doing this for 20 years, and I have a coach. That's why I succeed. You need a coach, a mentor, a guide, someone who can get you across that bridge to the life you want to live. If this makes sense, I'm going to give you something that I know will help. It's my blueprint called Jumping the Gap, Kill Your Story, and Take Action. I want to help you get what you want in life, and this will help you do that. To get my book, just send a text to my phone, 213-409-8366, and text the word GAP, 213-409-8366, and text the word GAP, G-A-P. So allow me to introduce my guest. We are truly blessed to have with us a billionaire, Glenn Stearns. That's billion with a B. Glenn has not only had a lot of money success in his life, but a lot of other types of success as well. Glenn was featured on the show Undercover Billionaire on the Discovery Channel, where he was given the task of building a million-dollar business from scratch in just 90 days. But more than that, he only allowed himself to do it starting with $100, not using his contacts, not using his name, he was just a guy with a hundred bucks, a truck, and 90 days. Did he do it? How did he do it? Glenn's going to talk about that. He's also going to share his newest venture, Kind Lending. Glenn made his fortune in the lending business and now has launched Kind Lending, a new identity in the wholesale lending mortgage business. I have so many questions for Glenn, it isn't even funny. So let's just dive right in. Glenn, welcome to Shock to the System. Hey, how you doing, Dan? It's so good to, to meet you. I, I, I feel like I already know you a little bit from watching your show and your YouTube channel. Uh, but the, the first thing I want you to share is, would you tell my audience about your, your very privileged, very wealthy, <laughs> silver spoon in the mouth upbringing? Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> you know, it's funny because I'm listening to you and, and I mean, everything you're saying is exactly how I feel about... Um, success um and what we measure it by you know and 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 you know and and a lot of that for me has come down to really one main word which was happiness you mentioned mm -hmm. that uh you can you can look at it with with money or you can look at it with toys and other things but but um i have found that you know in the end What's all going to matter is, you know, did we live a fulfilled life and are we satisfied with what we accomplished and did we leave a mark, if that's what we were trying to do. Um, but yeah, you're right. I, I, I had a very lavish upbringing, right? My, my mom <laughs> cleaned homes. Uh, my dad was a printer. We lived in an apartment. Um, they struggled with alcohol and, and drugs. and But it was a... A happy family in a, in a weird way. I mean, you knew only what you knew, right? You know, Glenn, you're, you're being humble, and, and I appreciate that. But let's go a little deeper here, okay? Let's talk about what happened when you were in, what was it, the, the eighth grade? I had a child when I was in eighth grade, 14 years wow. old, yes. Wow. Um, that was and, a and little shock to the system, uh, <laughs> to say the least. Yeah, so, I mean, like... Fourth grade, you know, I had dyslexia real bad, and and I yeah. so I was held back in fourth grade. Um, I did have a child in eighth grade. Um, you know, I I, wow. I went off at that age. Um, and by tenth grade, I had a uh, an intervention with my teachers, my mom, and everybody saying I'm out of control, drinking and crazy stuff, mm. and just falling into the same. Uh, cycle as my parents and yeah, it makes sense. I mean, that's what happens when a kid grows up in that kind of environment. But w why do you think you persevered and were so resilient when most people who grow up in that way in that kind of environment, most people would just just crumble. I mean, what what made you so resilient? What I found, and this is, goes back to fear, right? When I was in eighth grade and I had what was going to be the worst thing in my life became a beautiful young daughter that became the best thing in my life. So I began to associate trouble and, and, and issues 
with wonderful outcomes after you look at it. If you look at anything, I think we learn over time. In the moment, it feels very um, painful and hard to deal with. It, yeah. For me, I think it got rewired to where I realized – Every time I've had this real big down draft and things were really going poorly, I go, okay, something really good's going to come out of this, you know? And so I've lived with excitement, not fear about what was around the corner. You know, my mom was, uh, when we were young, my mom would put us in the car, let's go kids, we're going to get lost, you know? And <laughs> We would drive and drive and drive, and then we'd pull over on the side of some country road, and she'd go, oh, no, and we'd say, we're lost, you know, and it was so fun to find your way home and to see how to, you know, how to get back, and so if you start associating being lost with happiness and, and excitement yeah. versus, you know, fear, um, a lot of great things can come, you know, and then when you do that, you see opportunity. Right. And and you look at these down, uh, you know, these stock market turns that we've had recently and there's been a lot of great opportunity. Right. But if everybody's yeah. running for the door, maybe I should be running for the door. And I've never felt that way. I always run the other way. And do you think, Glenn, maybe it was that getting lost game that your mom played with you? Was that part of what gave you the courage to, to, to try new things? Oh, absolutely. I think maybe my yeah. dad was probably out of control at the house and wanted to get me, you know, I mean, who knows why, right? You know, my mom uh, w wiring my brain to yeah. allow the uncertainty to be your friend has really helped me, mm. you know, and, and, and later in life, I realize I like being in a place of uncertainty. You know, I put myself there many, many times. Yeah, cl clearly. And, and you know, I'm, I'm wondering, what, was that the impetus for leaving Maryland and driving across country to, to California, getting lost? Well, I was in college and I was at a bar and then I, and like, this is old. I don't want to do this anymore. And so I said, I want to go. Let's go. Let's, dr let's drive across country and see what's out there. And that was one thing was just getting in the car with a buddy of mine and let's let's go to California. Let's see what's out there, you know, and we just drove until we couldn't drive any farther. We sat on the yeah. stoop of the Queen Mary and the Spruce Goose in Long Beach going, yeah. it's only ocean, you know, there's nowhere else to go. We can't go west any farther. Yeah. And, you know, I, I think that's a big part of success and creativity. There's, there's nowhere else to go. So let's just see what we can create. Um, you, you know, I'm, I'm dyslexic, and I don't know if you went through this, but when I was growing up, uh, I was called stupid and retard and a lot of other things because, you know, I, I, I couldn't read. But, you know, I, I think it also, like, shifted my mind in a way that really opened up my creativity. And I'm, I'm just wondering if that happened to you. Yes, I do. And I think um, I have one son that was struggled with um, being very dyslexic and, mm -hmm. and having a lot of trouble reading and everything. And he's just grown with his personality and the ability to connect with people. And that's, I think, the compensation, right? You know, and, and we yeah. get that a lot. Uh, and, and so it's okay. You know, I think we compensate anywhere we go, you know. First, thank you for being so open and sharing all these intimate pieces of your life. Um, in, in my research for, to, for today's show, I watched a lot of interviews with you. And most people ask you the same kind of questions over and over. And I kept thinking, God, what, what can I ask him? So this isn't boring and he's just repeating the same stuff. And I, I think I came up with something. All right. So here it is. I find that most people, when they take on a new challenge, the thing they're afraid of most is failure. Now, for me, like luckily, I've had the advantage of trying new things and failing and getting back up again and doing that so, so often that failure really doesn't bother me anymore. But I, I'd have to think that you've had some kind of similar experiences. So would you be willing to talk about some of the lessons that you've learned through failure? Would, would that be okay? What I found in building a business, why I've had my, my employees um, and partners forever, like they start and we don't ever leave each other usually is because we go deep, right? We share mm -hmm. in and being vulnerable with each other. Wow. And so that means you need to expose your flaws. And, you know, there's no one perfect. Okay, obviously. But 
you know, I think I'm pretty good in this, but all mm -hmm. this area I'm really bad at. So why don't I find other people that can fill in those gaps? And then as a team, boy, are we going to look really, really, you know, strong together, right? It's funny because I, I asked the same question to Richard Branson and, yeah. and um, he, you know, never looked at it like failure either, you know, like everything right. was like, Oh no, I learned a really lot from that, you know? And so I'm trying to think like everything I think of, I don't think, I can't think of anything I failed at, but I had a lot of lessons along the way. Yeah, and I, you know, I, I guess the, the real reason that I'm asking that, Glenn, is I, I really want my audience to know from someone who's had a lot of ups and downs, like how do you do it? Like what's the mindset for, for struggling and That's getting right. back up again? All right, I'll give you one that, that uh, is the best example that I'll ever have, okay? Thank you. Um, and that is, you know, I created a company, a lending company that bared my name. National company that uh, we did, you know, millions of homes and I've been very, very proud of that company. And I sold a majority of that to a very large Wall Street firm five, six years ago. And, um, and I gave up control. They took their role of, of ownership and it was a lot different in how they ran the company than how I would run the company. Mm -hmm. Um, and I ran more with a heart, right? I went to the right. weddings. I went to the bar mitzvahs. I uh. went to the funerals. I went to a lot of things that, that shared in these families lives. And, um, and I care deeply right when the show was starting, uh, that I did the undercover billionaire show, which, mm -hmm. um, uh, the day they announced that show is the day that the company that I had previously owned declared bankruptcy. Okay. So same ironic oh. you know, day. And that's your name, right? My name. So oh. here is the wall Man. street journal calling me going, wait, are you the undercover billionaire or are you bankrupt? But the heart of the company was what mattered to me. And it got kind of clobbered, right? And it was not what it used to be. And it was very right. difficult. That, that's so painful. You know, it, it's, like, it's like you built this beautiful sailing ship by hand and you sold it to someone and they turned it into a party boat and sank it. The minute it happened, though, now this goes right to the point you're trying to make. How do we handle things when, when we get slapped in the face a little bit and we're down. So now I'm sitting here and, you know, I'm, I'm a little upset about it, but within 15 minutes, literally same day, 15 minutes of the call, um, I said, wow, now I can compete. Now I can go out and do this again. So not only did I move my family the next week, from Jackson yeah. Hole, Wyoming, where we were there living a very nice cush life. But I went back into Southern California, moved back into my old neighborhood, and um, they went through their bankruptcy and came out on the other side debt-free and off they run and they're fine. But wow. now I don't have any ownership, right? They, mm -hmm. they yeah. clean the slate and I'm out. Well, I went, I went back into the exact same building that was our corporate office, into uh -huh. the exact same top floor, and I leased the whole thing back out. I went back <laughs> into my old office, and as we speak, we're building the sign. So yeah. the, the old sign is coming down, and the new sign is going up, and I'm going to go do it again. And I have never had more fun than I am doing had than I am right now ever. That's amazing. You know, first first. Thank you again. Like, what a cool story. So I've, you mentioned Undercover Billionaire, and I've got to get to it. Um, I'll be honest. I was not expecting to love this show, but I've been telling everybody, you have got to see Undercover Billionaire on the Discovery Channel. It's amazing. So l let me paint the picture for my audience. Uh, they, they drop you in this little town in Pennsylvania. You only have 100 bucks and a crappy old truck, and you have just 90 days to build a million-dollar business. 
So when, when you get in that truck and you drive away from your private jet and your entire life, what was the first thing you thought of to start building your, your million dollar business? Well, I'll take you back for a second, which was that, um, you know, I did a show maybe four, 15 years ago with my mm -hmm. wife. It was called Real Gilligan's Island. And I won the whole thing. And then for the last 10, 12 years, people keep coming, say, hey, we got a great idea for a show. And I would either go, oh, I like that or... Or, you know, that doesn't sound like a great idea for me to do. But then I'd always end up going, you know, but I have a show for you. I said, you could strip me of everything I have and take me down to where I don't know a soul. And I will start over again. And I bet you I could redo it. And I'd always say that, you know, and then Discovery calls me back after years of saying that and said, hey, if you want to put your money where your mouth is, we'll do it. And so that first minute when I land and I'm out there and they give me the hundred bucks. My first thought was, what in the world was I thinking? Like, I don't have a plan <laughs> past, you know, getting off this plane and into this old beat up truck. What am yeah. I going to do? And I found, again, we talk about fear and you talk yeah. about being lost. I found like I enjoy I don't know it at the time. At the time, I'm miserable. At the time, I mm -hmm. want to run. I want to hide. I want to dig myself into a hole and not come out. Always. And But I realized I am right here where I've always said I want to be, which yeah. is fearful. And I'm not going to pull myself out of this one. What was I thinking? And I go, uh oh, I, I be careful what you wish for because now it's here, you know. And I just jumped in that truck and said, well, I got to go find, you know, food and shelter. That's my first thing. I got to, how am I going to be able to pay for the next three months? Oh, so you weren't thinking, oh, crap, how, how, how am I going to build this million dollar business? You were just looking at food and shelter, right? So, so you were able to, right. like, to compartmentalize down to your immediate right. needs. Do, do I have that right? Absolutely. And I found, you know, I've talked, to a lot of people that I found fascinating in my life. And one of them was a gentleman that uh, they did a movie about him called Touching the Void, where he was a rock climber. He and another guy he broke yeah, his leg yeah. and they cut the rope and he fell into a crevasse and he climbed for three days. You know, and he says, I just wanted to get to that rock. And if I could get to that rock, then I'll figure out what to do next. And so my first thought was just get enough money so that I can put aside all my worry about, you know, s just survival. And once I get past survival, I'll think about thriving and go to the next level. Yeah. And then that takes away that. And it was, that was the hardest part of the whole adventure for me yeah. was, you know, people living hand to mouth. It's the real deal. It's hard. You know, I mean, I went into some shelters and some places and helped. And saw that. Yeah. It was very difficult, you know. Yeah, but Glenn, I, like, I just, I have to understand this. How do you do that? How do you put aside all of your worries and all of your thoughts uh, about like, okay, this thing I'm trying to do, it's on a TV show. And if I fail at it, everyone's going to know. Like, how do you keep those thoughts from swirling around in your head? Because that's why most people resist taking on uh, any new challenge. Right. I, it might be part of that wiring because <laughs> I've never... You know, I just, I've never thought like that you, you just said it. What if I fail? I have to pay this million dollar. I don't, it, it was never about money. You know, mm -hmm. I've, for one reason or another, and I don't know why, but I've never dwelled on things that are out of my control. If they're wow. out of your control, why are you going to spend a second on it? What difference does it make? And so I don't think about those type of things. I just think of what's immediate in my control and then when I get some time, usually it's in the shower where I sit for a while. And yes, mm -hmm. that means I waste a lot of water. I just sit <laughs> and I just think about the bigger picture. So is that why on the show you wanted to stop sleeping in your truck just so you could have a place to take a shower? Is that the only way that you could devise your, your grand scheme? Right. The secret to your success is just because you, you shower more often. That's right. It's funny, but you know, it's true. I mean, I think we all need that quiet space wherever we want to mm. do it, and, you know, and whatever we want to call it and call it meditation. It doesn't matter, but you <laughs> need to clear your head and you need that time by yourself, I think, to regroup and, you know, and 
Um, I have found that others around me don't have a similar, uh, you know, stomach for a lot of it. They they usually mm. they they say we've gone too far too fast, and I'm like, what? You know, it doesn't seem to bother me as much as it does them, but you know. One of the things I really appreciated about the show, Undercover Billionaire, was the way you talk about selling. And the, the majority of the coaching that I do, I focus on sales because I found that wherever you're struggling in life, it shows up in a sale. Yes. Right? So if you're struggling with feeling confident, it shows up in a sale. Right? If you're struggling with believing in your product, it shows up in a sale. Right. But w what is it you think that makes you such a good salesperson? And what is it that makes someone like a really bad salesperson? Most people are always selling, right? Like we sell to make friends. We sell to find a, a significant other. And what I found is that being authentic, right, and being real yeah. says to me, okay, this is my way of sell selling. A lot of times you end up saying things to people that they you think they don't want to hear, right? Because mm -hmm. oh, it's painful. Yeah, I do that a lot. <laughs> yeah. And when you tell them things they don't want to hear, most of the people beat their chest and the desk and they hit the wall and they walk out of there and they come back and go, thank you. You know, like they know they need to hear it. They know that's mm -hmm. how they grow. Right. Yeah. Got it. And, and do you use that same philosophy in your leadership? Like, how, how do you lead? I've led through what I call and a lot of people call servant leadership, right? I work mm -hmm. for you. That helps me because I can come across a little more real and not, you know, again, when people live in fear, this is the boss. Yeah. He might fire me if I say mm -hmm. something wrong. You know, some of those people felt it. if you bring up something that's not working right, then you are sh showing the flaws in the system and this is a reflection of management. Well, I'm the exact opposite. Please bring up the flaws yeah. because we all make mistakes and we just want to make it better quicker. But if we hide <laughs> it under the rug, then it's just going to percolate under there and it's going to become a bigger problem later. Right. Like I tell my clients all the time, don't focus on fixing problems, right? You want to create new systems so those problems don't happen again. That's right. The other thing I wanted to ask you about is that on Undercover Billionaire, like it, it was amazing. People would work f for you without you being able to pay them much. Right. And they still, like, they busted their ass for you. And, and, and this is important because what I saw is that you inspire something inside of people that makes them want to be, like, greater versions of themselves. And so is, is this a skill that you developed or is that just, like, a part of who you are? Just being a student of reactions and people and everything and trying to be that I've learned that when I am up front or when I am engaged and when I listen and when I care, I seem to get uh, a deeper relationship with people and that means a oh. lot to me. I guess what I mean by that, you know, people have always asked, like, didn't you just think she had the most beautiful eyes or didn't he have the best teeth? I'm like, I didn't even see her eyes or his teeth. I was looking at, like, did they blink too long? Do they look away when they talk to you? Like, are, is this person a truth teller or is this person somebody that doesn't want to be here? And so I'm analyzing someone's face to see yeah. whether I want to spend more time and get closer or I just don't want to be around them. Glenn, I, I know that you had a really difficult upbringing. I also know that kids who grew up in a home with a lot of chaos, they develop this kind of superpower, right? They become excellent at reading people. They, and they, because they have to be able to look in their parents' faces and immediately assess what kind of day they're going to have. Do you think you had to read your parents or your father to know if this was going to be like a blow up day or if this was going to be a calm day? Yeah, I never thought of it that way. I don't know. But when I graduated high school, my mom left him and that was the day he stopped drinking and drugging and, you know, and hmm. and the world changed for him. And he's become an amazing, amazing man. That's that's really beautiful, Glenn. I mean, so so few people can really turn their their lives around like that. Um, w would you be willing to tell us a little bit about the scholarship program that that you work with? 
So I'm part of a group called Horatio Alger, and um, what we do is we give scholarships to um, kids that have gone through severe adversity. I just love these kids because they're they have gone through things you would never ever wish on anyone, and yet mm. they've decided to be the victor, right, instead of the victim. You know, and I often, you know, scratch my head, and so do a lot of the other members. Like, what made them take the right when their brothers and sisters took the left? You know, they're dead in jail, whatever. Right. And, um, you know, and, and that secret, you know, I don't. I think we're still trying to understand you know, why do people with severe adversity either rise above everything or fall and become part of the system, you know? And So why did you? Do you know? I don't, you know, I had a couple mentors. You talked about mentors either early yeah. on. Yeah, who were your mentors? Yeah, when I was young and I was a, a roller skater in 1978 when skating was in, there was um, this one gentleman that was the, I mean, literally the manager of the roller rink. And um, he just said to me one day, he just says, you know, you're going to be a leader one day. I can see wow. how you act, Glenn. And I just went, oh, Ronnie, stop, stop, D don't say that, you know? And I was embarrassed, but I thought in the back of my mind, I go, I wonder why I said that? And I really liked that. And so these little seeds and what I found, mm -hmm. and I do it purposefully a lot with young people is say, wow, do you have some leadership skills or little things to plant seeds in their mind? And you never yeah. know what's, you know, if it's going to germinate and what's going to take hold. But for me, Literally, probably two times in, from grade school and through college did this happen. Not a lot. God, yeah, you know, that just goes to show you what a difference we can make in other people's lives. You know, these the little offhanded comment that a roller rink manager said to you had such a big impact uh, uh, on your life. Um, getting back to Undercover Billionaire, during the show, you dropped all these little pearls of wisdom, and I'd write them down. I started calling them Glennisms. And not to embarrass you, but I, I got to share just a few of them with my audience right now. All right, guys, uh, check these out. No job is beneath you. Working hard at a job, any job, builds confidence. People miss out on a lot of opportunities when they panic and quit too early. Find your buyer first. Most people do it wrong. They create a product and then they go looking for someone to sell it to. I've been successful because I've surrounded myself with people smarter than I am. But there, there was one of these in particular that I really liked a lot. You, you said, every minute I'm focused on survival is a minute I'm not focused on the business. And that's like, that's easy to say, but when you're living in it, you know, when you're someone who's living in survival, how do you get out of the survival mentality so you can focus on climbing higher? Right. That's exactly what I was saying earlier is that I knew I had to just focus on that one mark of, of, of putting survival in the rear view mirror and then focusing on thriving. And, and that was the hardest part. There's yeah. a lot of people out there that just, keep working on just enough to pay, you know, for their food and hopefully their electric bill. And what would you suggest that they do? You know, someone who is, who's trapped in survival, what would you suggest for, for getting them out of that, that, that mindset? Yeah. Well, I think there's a lot of the problem comes when we, we live in the fear, we live in the denial, we live in the fact that we're never going to get this, you know, figured out. We, mm -hmm. you know, when you spend the time talking yourself out of why you're going to do something versus just doing it, you've lost a lot of time. Right. And, mm -hmm. you know, you look at people that get up on that high dive, you know, these young kids, <laughs> they go to the end, they go, Whoa, there's a lot higher than I thought it was. Right. Yeah. And, so whenever I got up on the diving board, I looked, I went, whoa. And then I just dove, right? Like, why you sit and think about it? It's not going to do me any good. Yeah. So what I, I hear you saying is that you take action before you let your mind start to tell you the stories that creates the fear that would keep you stuck. Is, it, is that it? Right. You see, if you focus on the story that will talk yourself out of whatever this thing you fear at the time, 
versus look at the bigger story, which I always love to look at, which is I can't wait when I get finished with this, I'm going to be talking to my friends about what we just did. Right. You know, and so I find the story of the success and the story of what could be much more interesting to me than that moment. So you got to look at the bigger picture and, you know, and when I've been in the middle of the crapper and I've been down in the bottom, then I always go, this is going to make the best part of the story. Right. You know? (laughs) And so you gotta, you gotta turn it in your head. And if you don't, then you're going to sit there going, I can't get out of this hole. There's, you know, versus boy, this is going to be the best part, you know? And that's just, what you, you have to trick your mind. And Glenn, that's terrific advice because you're not getting rid of the story. You're reframing the story right. and telling yourself a better outcome. Now, I'm, I'm going to ask you one more question. And I think this is really important, right? If you were going to build a mindset of success from, from the ground up, what would be the foundation of that, of that mindset? Like, what would you put into it? I go back again to looking at the bigger picture versus the moment you're in the middle. I told my wife, I would love to be on a bench with you when we're 85, 90 years old. We're all wrinkled and, you know, and (laughs) and we're just sitting on this bench and our grandkids, our great grandkids, they come running up to us, you know, we're on this hill looking out over the water. And they look at us and think, ah, they never lived, you know, and I'll just laugh and go, you have no idea, kid, you know what we went through and what fun we had. And so there's a a goal down the road. And my goal, yeah. if you talk about the foundation, is to be able to take my last breath and feel very, very satisfied that I lived the best life I could live, that I didn't just sit back and and live in fear that I took every swing I could and I went down, you know, swinging and I was very, very, um, and I left a path, um, so to speak of, um, happiness and people feeling touched and Mm -hmm. inspired. And those are the kind of things I want to do. So when I take that last breath, I want to smile. And I, so every day I literally think, am I working towards, that goal of feeling I did the best job I could. You know, it's, it's interesting to me that you say that because your life as it is now essentially began on a bench. That's right. When you made that choice, when you said, uh, I want to live a bigger life, I want to create great things, uh, that happened on a bench in California. That's right. And now it seems like this bench concept is— Kevin McCarthy, yeah. our house leader— has said to me, I want you to get that bench, Glenn, and go back. Because I did. I right. sat on that bench in Corona del Mar and got it totally inspired. And I said, wow, I want to make something of myself. And I walked out to the man in his yard. What did it take to get this house, sir? I know I can mm-hmm. do it. And he was like, senor, I'm the gardener. I said, I think <laughs> the guy's in real estate, yeah. but I'm not the owner of this house. And you know, I was like, all right, I'm going to get into real estate. <laughs> And I mean, that's literally, truthfully, the story and how it happened. And, and um, you know, but you got to have a vision, right? It's important yeah. to have a vision. Yeah. So before we wrap up, I want to talk to you about your new company, your foundation. And I also want to talk about how do we connect with you? First off, connecting. I'm on um, all the social media sites as Glenn Stearns. So G-L-E-N-N-S-T-E-A-R-N-S. So I think I'm that on um, Facebook and Instagram and whatever the other ones are. I'm on all those. And um, <laughs> and then uh, we have a podcast, uh, and it's called Grit Happens as well. You know, so Grit Happens is our podcast. Fantastic. Good. And um, so we're out there just as as uh, we can. We started Kind Lending in a wonderful different world. You know, we're out there making fun of ourselves and we're laughing. And, <laughs> you know, you, when you think about work, you're there for more the time in a day than you are with your families, you know? Yeah. You, and so it's been happening and it's magical right now. Everybody, you know, is really, really enjoying themselves. And, and we feel like we kind of got the lightning in the bottle as we had from the past, you know? And so I'm really proud of the company. Glenn, I I could literally talk to you for hours. Uh, Everything that you've talked about today, everything that you've shared, it's about living a better life. 
And that's what that's what shock to the system is all about. So what have we learned today, Glenn? We've learned it's important to take more showers. Right. We've learned about stay, staying out of the survival mentality. We've learned to inspire people with our vision. We've learned the value of sitting on benches. <laughs> but, but seriously, we've learned it's all about finding the thing that creates the most happiness and contentment for ourselves. And clearly for you, Glenn, that's been about giving back and about making a better life for other people. What you've said to today and throughout the show, that's the message I kept seeing. How am I giving back? How am I creating deeper relationships? How can I reach this person's heart? I think for a lot of people, those things sound trite or unimportant when it comes to business. You know, people say, well, I'll do all those things once I become wealthy. Right. I, I like what you said on the show. You said money magnifies, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And what you explained is that whoever you are now, you will only become more of that with money. Like, like if you're a giving person now, you become more giving. If you live in scarcity now, you feel even greater scarcity with more money because like, you, obsess, you become obsessed with the fear of losing it. I, I know that sounds crazy, but I see it all the time. Glenn, thank you so much. Uh, once again, I want to offer my audience my blueprint for getting what you want called Jumping the Gap, Kill Your Story, and Take Action. Uh, you know, Glenn, maybe I think you should read my book so you can you know, actually make something out of your life. Uh, if you want to get my book, just send a text to my phone, 213-409-8366, and text the word GAP, G-A-P, 213-409-8366, and text the word GAP. And if you want to connect with Glenn, and you'd be crazy not to, listen to his podcast called Grit Happens. Check out his company, Kind Lending, at kindlending.com. You can check out Glenn's personal website at glennsterns.com and watch his videos on YouTube. Just go to YouTube and search for at Glenn Stearns. And finally, 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 watch Undercover Billionaire on the Discovery Channel at discoverychannel.com. Glenn, thank you so much for being here. I just love what you shared today. And thank you to my audience for hearing Glenn's words and challenging yourself to step up to new ways of being. We have more great shows with more great guests coming up, so stay plugged in and put a shock to your system. Thanks again, Glenn. Thanks, Dan. If you have some thoughts about this show you'd like to share with us, or if you think you're shocked to the system guest material, send me a text at 213-409-8366. Let me know what you think or let me know why you think you'd be a great guest for this show. Thanks again for listening. Stay well.